Every year, the world celebrates World Television Day on November 21 to acknowledge the importance of the visual media. The first World Television Forum was celebrated on November 21 in 1996, and the day later came to be known as World Television Day. Yesterday, the UN called for hashtag no more sexist ads, hashtag no more stereotypical roles, hashtag no more objectif objectification. It also said there should be no more underrepresentation. UN women are calling for a new standard for how women and girls are portrayed on television and the entertainment industry. Joining us now for a discussion on this, Jacintha. De Nobrega is spokesperson for SWIFT, uh, Sisters Working in Film and Television. She is also film uh, producer. Uh, Sarah Chitambo is an independent filmmaker. Justice Mukedi is a film producer and fine artist. And Nombule Loshang is a sociology lecturer at the University of the Free State and a feminism scholar. Welcome to you all and thank you so much for speaking to us. Let me start with uh, you, uh, Nomlula, your views on this, the entertainment industry. So it's a very important mode of communication and information sharing. But to your mind, how has it performed here in South Africa in accurately portraying women and children, especially through the ages? Um, I'll talk a little bit about the black womanist experience. So often the way that the media portrays black women can at times be highly... Um, sexualized, high, highly stereotypical, and um, this can at times have an impact on um, how we engage with our society. So in a lot of ways, our bodies are often seen as being in service of, of men and to sort of satisfy whatever their sexual desires and pleasures might be. And in instances when um, that is not how we behave, um, that, that the violence that comes as a result of that um, it definitely, I think, stems a lot from how we're portrayed in the media and adverts um, and just other spaces in life. Mm. And I'd imagine I'll come to you, uh, Jacintha, the film and television sector, uh, they've contributed to the fa framing of public opinion of women and girls, but uh, have they been purposeful about it? Uh, and looking at the work that SWIFT is doing? Has there been a marked change? I think certainly we've seen a change slowly with the outroar and the out uprising of the Me Too um, movement. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a real shift and it really stems off of who is telling these stories, right? Mm. So uh, traditionally we have white males telling our stories and telling women's stories. And so once you see um, when women start telling their own stories, you will see that change, that narrative will start to shift. We have seen um, an uptake and we've seen a, a slight shift, but there's so much work to be done. You know, just having a conversation around um, gender-based violence, sexual harassment, our industry is rife um, with these kinds of issues. You know, it's, there's been quite a bit of pushback, but we, we kind of starting to have that conversation. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we open up the and normalize it. But really what has to happen is that women need to start writing and telling their own stories. And that means, you know, you need to have women, female directors, female writers, female HODs, so that we can control how we are displayed within the film industry or within the media. Mm. And, and we'll talk about the work structure in just a moment, but on just a basic uh, level, just as I'm going to ask you how what you confronted when you got into the industry, the work that you've done, what was the kind of thinking that informed not only the decisions that you made, uh, but how you projected women and girls? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And thanks for directing that to me. Um, I must clarify first, I'm not a film producer, I'm a film director. Yes, apologies um, for that. Uh, I thought we corrected that, yes. Mm -hmm. No, don't worry. So um, I think the things that I confronted when I, when I got into the industry um, are different. I think maybe I can start with my own outlook to occupying space and the work I had to do to dismantle and unpack my maybe predetermined notions of 
my positioning in occupying space, be in employment or being a film director. Um, I think the beginning of my career and the beginning of just me being me, I was never considerate of how I occupy space and um, my presence and um, dominance just for the sake of being a man and having a penis, you know, and really that was the big difference. But I think as men, we grow in a world or societies that enable us and teach us um, and we inherit the, our toxic masculinity and we lead lives unconscious and not present of our contribution to the issue of being uh, toxic men that are just occupying space without giving room for other so people. So what was the wake-up so, call for you? Did it, was it anything that brought it home to you that you've got uh, uh, relatives who would be representative of that woman, uh, that woman, uh, that girl yeah. that is being portrayed in the manner that is being portrayed? What brought it home to you that there needs to be a change and that it mm. is toxic masculinity? Mm. Uh, I think for me the, the, the interesting was the parallel and the relativity or the relation of gender and race <clears throat> and being a black man occupying space and seeing uh, the, uh, the prejudice and the injustice and all the stuff that um, I go through just for being black made me also think that women are treated differently just for having different uh, sexual organs, you know, and that to me was a very quick thing to land at home that you know i need to be mindful of who i am when i occupy space because for generations and generations and generations men have been put on a pedestal just because they are men and that's unfair just like for generations and generations the white person or the white man has occupied space of being put on a pedestal and you know it's it, it was quite really uh, okay. similar for me and i we also need looked more at more men like justice sorry i just have to say that <laughs> we need more work men like you thank you <laughs> and, and i was just been showing your work say, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah go ahead I, I have to say being maybe if we call it being woke i don't think being woke is enough i think it's a, an everyday challenge and everyday effort to, to be, be present it, in yeah. all that to be conscious and to yeah. to be attentive of every little thing i do because i grew up in a world where i just bulldoze and get all the things i want because i'm a man right but if i'm present in my engagement of the world and my okay. every move justice let me bring I'm Sarah better into and this. I must, uh, and we have been sure. uh, putting uh, in the background some of your work so people can just get a sense of what you're talking about, how uh, you um, portray um, individuals. And I'm not going to say just women and children, but just your thought process into yeah. some of the, your work. Mm -hmm. Sarah, let's look at the industry as an advocacy tool. You do it because you love mm -hmm. it. I know you've got a film uh, that you made and some of these things you had to bring home because it's about education, it's about conscientization, you know. But just tell me what you confronted and yeah. how easy or difficult it was for you to be able uh, to, as I say, advocate uh, for the rights of women and girl children to be accurately portrayed. Exactly. I think that's, uh, as Justice um, Nombulelo and Jacinta have said, it's not easy for men, I mean, for women, especially being a woman of color, black woman uh, mm -hmm. in this industry. And uh, just to use, if you've been seeing what uh, Justice's work um, initially started off as, they had a collective called I See a Different You. You know, and that for me just narrows it down to if I don't see myself reflected on the screen, I have to do something yeah. about it as a black woman. I have to yeah. see my reality <laughs> reflected back to me. Yeah. And if not, then I have to do something about it. Same thing that Jacinto was saying. How do we push to have more women on writing teams, making the decisions and conscious de decisions, deliberate decisions to position black women 
differently. So it has been an, it's an on, on, ongoing journey for me to be able to confidently push my voice, position mm -hmm. and fight for why uh, I think we need to be represented a certain way as a, a, a way to reflect my lived experience. So it is an ongoing fight in the in the trying to balance what the entertainment value is and, you know, without creating and perpetuating further stereotypes. So it's a constant mm. balance to know, we know we need to tell stories and we're rich with stories, but they need to be balanced and we need to be able to see ourselves in a dignified manner that is celebratory of our lives. Mm. And normally I'll come back to you. You spoke earlier on about the fact that uh, especially black women continue to be objectified. I want to talk about the social construction of work and the workplace. Obviously, if you are seen as nothing, you can't really contribute to how you are portrayed. And South Africa in this day and time, it doesn't, for me, when I'm looking, when I'm watching television, uh, speak to me about the fact that there are women in the boardroom. There are women who make decisions. There are women who employ men and help uplift their livelihoods, who uh, actually give them agency to, uh, to, to develop, to create, you know, all of those things that women are not credited with. So the social construct of the workplace, how do we fix that, not only in the cultural industry, but as a whole, so that is accurately um, reflected? So, I mean, as Jacinta already alluded to earlier, it's definitely about having representation and not just on one level, but on all um, layers and levels within an organization um, to ensure that black women are represented, are represented not just at the bottom, which is what's often done, um, but throughout um, so that we can avoid these kinds of stereotyp stereotypical... But how do you do uh, that if I don't see it? I mean, for th which is exactly well, my point, that young girls won't know that it's possible <laughs> if it's not unfortunately on our screens yes just that they, you've got your finger up there so that's exactly that i have my hand up so that's exactly it so you know we always see women as ceos but they're always cold heartless and they're these tough women and they're not married and they don't have kids Absolutely. but that is not right you know and so when we start to see women that are ceos and they have compassion and they have empathy and they have kids and they have a husband because the thing about women is that we are empathetic we are compassionate and that gives us the ability to multitask and to be able to be mothers and wives and still go into the uh, the boardroom and be a boss there and we're not all cold and heartless we are and when we are sensitive and empathetic and you know, we Jacinta, are told it's so that interesting. we're not passing It's so interesting what you're saying because I saw something um, on uh, social media with regards to COVID-19 and how obviously we've brought the boardrooms into our homes. How men are somehow almost stuck like what am I going to do? There's all of this caregiving that needs to be done. Uh, some people yeah. saying that they're seeing a different persona when they're looking at their wives and husbands as a CEO because they're no longer in that workplace and they, they get introduced to somebody new. And I thought that was a very interesting revelation how workplaces in themselves change people, how being forced to work from the workplace to look at uh, the home life and, and be at the uh, uh, helm of it. That also influences the decision making. Correct, and I think that will also start to shift the narrative about how women are seen. But it's so important to show us in a multi, we layered, and we're not just these either heartless, cold mm. women, um, or these mothers, uh, you know, washing powder uh, ads where we, you know, we're doing the cleaning in the house. We do many things. So, uh, if yes, I have to add my, my two cents yes. to that, I think, you know, it's such a missed opportunity um by the world to not put more women or by men to not put more women into positions of power because it only makes sense i mean who who's a better leader if you know it is not a woman because women bring up all the men that we see in this world that are powerful you know i'm a man because my mom made me a man you know and the power of women and how they are nurturing and all that it's so amazing and it's such a missed opportunity and i think yeah. 
the shift and the difference the industry needs to see needs to be brought and the contribution needs to be made by men because mm. women have nothing to do with it you know until men stand up and because they occupy maybe 80% of the space until we all stand up collectively and create room for women mm. you know then we'll see real change because you know women have been fighting and standing up and you know pushing and yes there is change but there's will be better change if we collectively stand up as men and create the space mm. no, Mulele, you know? i want so. to look back at the hollywood experience for instance um at the very beginning when South Africa started having these soapies, it seemed like a lot of the portrayal of even black people was based on that. Uh, from a you know, sociology lecture perspective, what has been the impact on that, on the production of media images, the subjectivity to it, uh, the immunity from review, the stereotypes, the cliques uh, that have informed our industries? I think we must remember that media also mimics and represents um, the real world and life. So often what is um, portrayed within films is at times what's happening um, in, in society and, and the two sort of inform each other as a cycle. Um, and so a lot of the times the portrayal of women and, and black people in media is, is often to maintain um, the status quo, be it um, the patriarchal status quo, be it um, the racialized status quo, to ensure that a certain group or a certain class or a certain gender um, maintains dominance at the at the top, while everybody else works in their service. Um, so, um, and as Jacinta was saying, what 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 helps to shift and what helps to change that is is the move to start. Um, being representative um, and representative at different levels within organizations, within institutions. But obviously there's difficulties even with that. And I think it's very important for us as black people in different spaces that we find ourselves in, but in the, for the interest of this topic, particularly in media, to start open up, opening up space for each other, to start mm. um, being uncomfortable with being the first or the only or the mm. tokenized version yeah. of a black woman leader or a black um, uh, man in leadership. And I was intrigued, uh, Sarah, you did that with uh, a, a film you just recently did, and I, I think it hinted a lot about internally displaced people, especially here in South Africa. Um, what were your challenges? And, and I know you had female lead characters as well. When you were yeah. writing that, when you were building that narrative, because it's also about humanizing them in a country where uh, xenophobic um, attacks, as some have labeled them, or Afrophobic um, attacks have uh, you know, risen time and time again over the years. Absolutely. And I think it just goes back to challenging what is um, considered to be watched by audiences. A lot of the time we, got, we get told that you have to make television, you know, you have to make uh, content that people are going to consume. But sometimes you have to challenge the viewer. You have to trust that the viewers are intelligent enough to be able to mm -hmm. um, see the content you, you are putting towards as something they can be empathetic towards, even if it may not have anything to do with them. So really to humanize people and to see people holistically uh, in the way that uh, we portray them, is, it's, it's very powerful television because of everything everybody's been saying about being able to mirror the society we live in. But it's also, it can be something that's aspirational, it can be something that's escapism, but with the responsibility to change the way people think and to challenge the way people think i think that's the most important thing is just to realize people's own abilities to broaden their mind and challenge and push their own limits of the way they think about things so mm -hmm. i think it's it, it always presents us with an opportunity to learn to entertain and also to grow and um mm -hmm expand our horizon in the, in the way we think about Justice, the world. Justice, what are you exposed to? Who are the women in your life and how are you using your work uh, to, you know, celebrate them if that's uh, the angle that you're going for or even just introduce them to the world? Because uh, often how mm. we see people is it, different to how the next person sees them. 
as much as we're yeah. multidimensional, there has to be a core truth to who we really are in this day and age. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, the woman in my life, you know, my mom is, is, you know, right up there. She's all that I am. She's my reason for being. She's my source of inspiration. And yeah, then, you know, I've got my partner who is incredible and inspires me and I'm grateful for her. And I've got colleagues like Desiree at Bomb Shelter, you know, I've got Helena, I've got Roseanne. You know, I've got friends, I've got, yeah, I've got a whole lot of friends that I can't name drop all of them, but I've got incredible women in my life that allow me to make mistakes and uh, account for those mistakes and learn from them and try to build myself up to be a better man that inspires other men, young and old, to be better in their ways, you know. Mm. Uh, and I want to talk about just since the, the reward systems because this is a very important thing. How they amplify and diminish, amplify or diminish sex differences and other work outcomes. We've seen, uh, especially in the media lately, of women who have been sexually harassed and abused. And, and this all has to do with the subjugation that comes with those reward systems because if you're not seen unheard, your terms and conditions are going to be different. What you have to do extra to be treated as an equal is also different. Mm. Um, so in terms of like the, the, the sexual harassment, is that what you're talking about? That yes, the reward systems, yes, the reward systems within the industry. Well, I think, you know, um, until we start to shift that conversation about seeing women as equal, you know, as SWIFT, we are advocating for equal rights, so equal um, representation in front and behind the camera. We are, are advocating for equal pay, pay parity. So we have a huge issue around pay. Women are paid much less. Women are, are offered much less opportunities. And so once we start working towards equality, you know, in front and behind the camera, we will see a shift. Um, unfortunately, this industry has been for years and years, it's such a, it's not a corporate industry. So it has its own own rules. And for the longest time, there's been that status quo. But now that we are shifting and we see women coming into positions of power, black people coming into positions of power, where we are able to tell our stories right and direct, we are slowly starting to see that shift. Mm -hmm. However, we still have to fight for women. And the biggest issue we found with so when we did some research is that Women are not, don't feel safe on sets. So what we're doing right now is we are trying to ensure that they are, uh, women feel safe on sets. So before we can start really jumping up and down around pay parity and gender parity, we really have to make sure that women feel safe on sets. And so we have a pilot program with SWIFT that we're running right now. It's called the Safety Contact Officer, where we are delivering impact sessions around sexual harassment in and on sets, um, mm. which has become very, very popular and, and really good. And Sarah is actually heading that pro program. So um, she can maybe just talk one, uh, say a little bit about that too. I think it's, it's exactly what Jacinta is saying about dismantling the hierarchy and the patriarchy that does tie into positions of power on sets. So originally, traditionally, men are the heads of departments, men are the directors, men are who we go to when we're seeking opportunities. So when we start to break um, that power and start to create a level playing field, more people are making decisions and ensuring that women are safe, protected, and in safe working environments where they can also express themselves creatively, fully, and trust that their opinions and uh, their decisions in terms of creating the content are also going to be trusted. So I think it's very important to start at the base of to dismantle the, the, the hierarchies uh, that yeah. patriarchy has brought in that put so much um, in jeopardy, not just in terms of the storytelling, but also in terms of people's own safety and well-being and mental health on set. So that is a place to start, and that's where we all have to collectively come in together, like Justice said. Like we understand and accept that there is a problem. How do we take it apart, and how do we move forward to be stronger uh, and have an industry that can actually, you know, mirror Hollywood in terms of quality because we're doing the work to tell our real stories. Mm. Uh, and Nobla, mm. just...
talking about the cultural industry, the creative industry, and how it's viewed as a whole. Uh, with the creativity, as we're saying, comes a whole lot of responsibility. Have attitudes changed? Because if we don't take it seriously, it means that some of the offenses that are occur are then not uh, recognized they're not called out because we almost uh, take it as something not to be uh, taken seriously as an influencer because if you for instance say i want to be a, a, a film director producer I, you know in my time when you were saying that people didn't think it was work so do we need an attitudinal, attitudinal change in that space first before we realize the sheer weight of the responsibility of uh, what creatives do uh, with these yeah. industries? Yeah, I definitely think there needs to be an attitude um, shift in that in that respect as well. And, and maybe th that's a role that media in itself can play in ensuring once again that there's, there's, there's better adequate representation so that you can start to see yourself in the career. Um, just to pull from what Sarah mentioned earlier, there's often these false um, narratives or ideas around what people want to see. And really at the core, of, I think what people want to see is, is we want to see ourselves in spaces. So I want to see myself in, in um, the media space being represented in, in different ways in which a black woman can be represented, not just in these kind of um, static, stereotypical ways. And I think when we start to see ourselves represented in the media and um, the role that the media can have in building our careers, the impact that it can have on ourselves, on our societies and on communities, um, that can also definitely shift mm. um, the perspectives and the perceptions around um, how important um, these types of roles and careers and, okay. and, and our participation in these in these spaces. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, which we had more. Thank you to all of you for contributing yeah. to the discussion. Jacintha Dinobriga, spokesperson for SWIFT, Sisters Working in Film and Television, Sarah Chitamba is an independent filmmaker, Justice Mkhedi um, is a film director and fine artist, and Nombulelo Shange is a sociology lecturer at the University of the Free State and a feminism scholar.